I am unashamed. What about you? Welcome back to the Unashamed podcast. We, uh, I'm still in the southern lair. Chase and Dad are in the studio. Zach is uh, MIA. Uh, once again, he's somewhere across the fruited plains, probably working on the movie or some other uh, project uh, for the future. You know, we've had so much success, uh, which thank you, Unashamed Nation. You guys have made it happen with the movie. Um, it's just, I, I think now probably there's more people talking about what do we do next, which is great. And so it's uh, we're very blessed and, and just want to say again, thank you uh, for all you guys, not only going, but also talking about it, going to Rotten Tomatoes and doing the reviews. All that stuff has worked. And uh, it's been a God thing. So, and dad, I've heard some amazing stories about a lot of life change already. And most people sit, that see it across the country, their friends of mine or people I have relationship with said, be sure and tell your mom and dad, thanks for telling their story. Cause I know that couldn't have been easy. So uh, people respect you and mom even more dad after, you know, you guys allowed uh, not, not necessarily the best part of your life to be put on a movie screen, but it's having a huge impact, which is, which is a blessing. Yeah, it really is. Um, I went this past weekend to the Mighty Oaks fundraiser. It was a gala. It was kind of a swanky thing, which uh, Missy, I guess, had looked up pictures from past Mighty Oaks events. I think this was the 13th annual. And so... It's our friend Chad Robichaux, which we've talked about before. Yep, and he was on our podcast. And, uh, yep. and I asked about being on again. I think it went real well. And so uh, I told him maybe when our duck season cranks up, he could come over and we'll. Yeah, I, we'll, I'd love to get uh, his son is going to be with. His son's a pretty amazing guy, too. So all these guys. Uh, maybe we can I mean, get both of them. Yeah. I, you know, it was, uh, it was something that was just a sacrifice that I wanted to do because uh, they wanted to hire me and pay me for the speech and I was like no charge and because I love our military and you know we have an epidemic in our in our country when it comes to our military you know the stats are hard to come by and Chad talked about that in his speech but on average there's about 20 of our veterans a day who commit suicide and that is a quite the number. And yeah. uh, so their program really helps with this PTSD. And, and I just was amazed, number one, uh, of being there. We did a an hour meet and greet, which I say it was an hour. It was probably more like 90 minutes. And it was sold out. But I was amazed how many people came up there talking about that movie Phil. so uh that was good uh, a lot of you know tears in their eyes and most of these people were you know military first responders or veterans or they were there you know with money because it was a fundraiser and they had a live auction kind of reminded me of the tebow event where yeah. you have speakers and i mean i was like speaker number four I mean, they were calling me the keynote speaker, but I, I felt a little inac inadequate, I guess, uh, to be there just because I hadn't had any kind of military experience. But uh, I did I did tell some side jokes and, uh, you know, Cy was in the in the military for 24 and a half years, which I put on there. There was evidence of God that he survived. And he was the only one in Vietnam with a Tupperware cup, which was true. That's it. That's true. That's <laughs> and I told a couple of stories about him, you know, where he – so I always tells that story. I don't think I've ever told it on uh, on the Unashamed, but he always tells that story where he lost some highly classified documents. And, of course, the first question you ask is, why did someone think it was a good idea for Cy – to take care of classified documents. <laughs> and right. Cy tells that story where he lost them. So then he gets, you know, they 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 call him in. And he's and they're like talking about demoting him for losing these documents. And he's like, hey, I hit them so well that I can't find them. 
You should be promoting me. <laughs> Just think how good I, they're hidden. I can't find them and I was in charge of it. And in size mine, that was a perfectly reasonable argument, That's which right. led them to, for a year, they made him go into an office and not do anything because he had screwed up. Their logic was, you screwed that up, so you're going to go in there. It, it's, it's quite the story, and I'm not sure how much of it is true, because you know how Cy <laughs> is. That, that's well, he, really... says, he says 95% of it is true, but I don't know about the numbers. Yeah. Well, then I told the story about uh, he was also the only man uh, in, in Vietnam, because then they moved him. He was in charge of uh, cargo. And just yeah. imagine that. Cy is telling who to ship what where. And so he was the only man who had a tire off of a deuce and a half stolen while he was driving it. Yes. He told that story on the last podcast. <laughs> he was on. <laughs> oh, my goodness. But they laughed. He said he never, got, he never got below 10 miles an hour. They took that tire off his truck. Yeah. So it was funny. But I told him about how, you know, uh, you know, a couple of things that probably people don't know about me is that when I – graduated high school, I was left with a decision on what I was going to do because back then Duck Commander had no employees. That came later. I, I think I was the first paid employee, you know, after this stint. But I was down to two options. I was either going to go to Bible school with you or I was going to go be a Marine. And I thought I was going to be a Marine. I mean, I had just made up my mind. I mean, let, let's go. But, you know, I I fell in love with Missy, and that was the main reason that I chose the Bible school because I just, you know, I, I, I just was having this idea of getting married and settle, settling down. So that was the catalyst. So Missy went with me on the on the trip. So I think she liked that part. But what I realized now, fast forward, here I am standing in front of you know all these these veterans and uh, first responders. And I kind of made an illustration of, you know, the weapons we fight with as disciples of Jesus. And I quoted that, you know, that verse are not the weapons of the world. And, and here we have a problem. And really what I saw as the problem, and it, I tied it in with your movie, Phil, because there's a line in the movie that I think is the most profound, is when Bill Smith, the pastor, told you, you know, you got you to gotta die, Phil. And when you look at trauma and, and tragedy, and even from if those of you who listen to all our podcasts, you remember in this Luke 13, where this situation came up, where Pilate had sacrificed a bunch of worshipers, and they had this argument to Jesus, well, you know, were they more guilty than other human beings? Because why would God, you're, you're claiming to be the son of God, why would God let that happen? And then Jesus brings up another tragic and trauma-filled story of a tower falling on 18 people and killing them. And he asked them the same question, were they more guilty? And you remember Jesus' response, which was, well, I'll tell you this. He doesn't really answer the question, why does injustice happen? Why does you know pointless suffering occur in our world? But he says, you need to repent or you'll perish. And we talked about that underlying theme of we're perishable. Ever since God's creation, which was perfect. There was no death or, you know, or sin or evil. Everything, God created this perfect, and it went wrong when evil, the evil one was there and the temptation came, and then people chose. They, they sinned, and then they were, you know, not only separated from the Father, but they turned on each other. Remember, they were blame Adam and Eve were blaming each other, and then these curses happen. And then there's a little subtle verse that I quoted in my speech, where they were separated from that tree of life, and they could no longer live forever. And so they were actually kind of separated from creation itself, and we became perishable. And and unfortunately, when you live in an evil world, and you don't have access to this tree of life. Suffering and trauma and tragedy is going to happen. And one of their sayings is uh, trauma is life. So it's not just, you know, our military. I mean, I've even seen it with, you know, my own daughter. We, we talked to her because of all the personal trauma she endured with all the surgeries and 
And people have stories and accidents happen, and we do live in an evil world. But I brought up that line in the movie, Phil, because I think people think, especially when they're dealing with trauma, they're, they're looking for a way out. And, and, and it's a lie that they're told, and they talked about it in their various uh, speeches. And, and even Chad Robichaud himself, you know, before he came to Jesus, he attempted suicide. Because he's like, well, I'm, I'm doing my, my family a favor. And, but that concept is really Jesus. When you look at what he did by him taking the abuse, the suffering for our injustices and our, and our sins, uh, and the injustice that, that happened to Jesus, he actually took care of these problems and gave us a platform through his death on a cross and the resurrection that we could start over. We could die spiritually. Yep. And I brought up Luke 15 that we studied, which is you remember when the son came back from the pig pen, when it got to the end and the older brother couldn't celebrate, the father said, we had to celebrate because your brother was dead yeah. and he's now alive. Yep. And so I said, look, the concept they're thinking that we all kind of have that concept of we've screwed up or we've had terrible things done to us and, and we just don't want to live life. And that's where Jesus, what he offers is so appealing. So, I said all that to say this, the, the things I was shocked about, about their program and their charity, it was way more Jesus-centered than I imagined, yep. way more, because they realized, even he's Chad has realized. Hope. He's the only hope they have. It, it's the greatest message to people that have been through trauma who can defer the injustices that have happened and that they've seen to when Jesus comes back. God will make everything right. There, there is life available, and eternity is available, and God has a, a special plan and purpose for all of us despite what we ha- we've gone through or what's been done to us. So that was kind of the platform. And, uh, you know, if you can't get behind that, what, what, what can you get behind? <laughs> I mean, that's it, all there is. Yeah. So they had a testimony, a guy who had recently come to Jesus, you know, a, a veteran, and it was incredibly powerful. And uh, they had what they do is they'll have several what they call camps or, you know, they'll they'll invite these veterans to these ranches, you know, and spend a week of talking to them about their trauma and all that. But they're introducing Jesus and they're not only saving soldiers' lives and in battling this PTSD. But they're also giving them the best hope that they could ever have. And, he, and even Chad said, look, you know, the government has really not embraced what they do, but he's like, why, why, why not give it as an option or give people the ability to choose a faith-based treatment for this program along with the other programs that are so I'm, I'm proud to have supported that i was proud to be there uh, i had a lot of friends there and it was a spectacular event and if you're ever looking for something to support it's fantastic so one of the great uh, things about doing our podcast is you know we get to partner with a lot of uh, different companies that uh, kind of walk alongside us, share a lot of our value system and our love for Christ, our love for country. And uh, one of those is our friends at Barrel Buddy. And uh, we have what we call a boarding call where we get on a call with folks and just they tell us about their product. And we tell them about our podcast, try to see if it's a match. And when these guys at Barrel Buddy, we first got on the phone with them, first thing they wanted to do was pray. And I said, you know what? I'm I'm thinking this is probably going to work out, and it has because they're a great partner. They have a good product uh, that they came up with, just like we came up with our duck call uh, out in a, in a hunting field uh, because they saw a need to be able to make sure your weapons are clean. And so the uh, the little uh, polymers that Jace has there in front of him uh, are what they came up with. Uh, they're they're white polymers to show what comes out of your gun. All the residue, uh, it's cleaner, doesn't make a mess, and the old systems that didn't work very well, uh, they've come up with something really good. So uh, good Christian guys, great company, 
uh, something all of us need who are hunters. Their their polymers fit in any gauge, uh, all of the shotguns, any pistol, any rifle. So whether you're a gun enthusiast or a hunter, check out Barrel Buddy. Dot com. That's where you can find their product, Barrel Buddy, B A R R E L Buddy.com. Now, Jace, I was thinking that when you when you were describing that, because the conversation I had with Chad, uh, somebody had sent me, maybe he sent me, somebody had sent me a, uh, where he was testifying before Congress about veteran or b- before the Veterans Affairs Group just trying to get them on board because their numbers are so great and their success rate uh, at helping guys one, not commit suicide, but two, you know, really get their life right. And we understand that from a spiritual perspective, but you, like you said, the sad thing to me is is that our government, which should at least give us options. I mean, you know, they take this idea of separation of church and state too far because like they, the mighty Oaks is a fantastic track record of helping people. And so why would you not want that to be successful? And it's just the only thing I can figure is there's just the evil ones got control, too much control um, in in a lot of our government, which is really sad because you're talking about vets. You know, you're talking about guys who laid it on the line for our country. We should be offering them the best opportunities. And look, they can decide whether they want to go to a faith based situation or not. I have talked to several podcast listeners that are. Uh, part of these, I think they call them outposts, which are different uh, groups around the country that are support groups that are connected to Mighty Oak. So if somebody's out there listening and maybe going through some marriage stuff or uh, maybe it's suicidal thoughts, maybe it's whatever, uh, and you're a vet, be sure and reach out because there's help. And it's not only in, in what the main organization is doing, but they've got people all around the country because you sent me notes and said, hey, I listen to the podcast, but I, I'm also an outpost leader who are helping vets on a regular basis. And most of them are vets themselves. So uh, again, Jace is right. We just, and Jace, I thank you for doing that, for going and speaking because there's not a better honor uh, than to help veterans who have basically provided us with everything we have in our freedom. So, Oh yeah. Um, and I mean, look, I was, for going. I was humbled and amazed. And look, these people, uh, you know, what really came out is, is yes, Jesus was talked about more than, I could have ever imagined and a love for people. You know, these guys, a lot of them are retired and uh, they've been on so many trips around our world, whether it's, uh, you know, getting innocent women who have been sold into sexual slavery and, and yep. human trafficking to, uh, Afghan, you know, all those Afghan, um, Oh, interpreters and people that help them. And I met yeah. Aziz, his, and they're, you know, they're going to do a movie yeah. about it and uh, his, his interpreter. Because, you know, these people, once we left Afghanistan, you think, well, what happens to these people who sided with America who were interpreters and all that? Well, they kill them. Yeah. And so, but but these guys, they love people, and uh, they've been on these very dangerous missions where they got people out. And uh, – I'm just appreciative. These guys who represent us and represent freedom and put their lives on the line, even when they pay their own dime to help people across the world, it is just absolutely incredible. It's heartwarming. So Yeah. Yeah, I had a, a few years ago, I had a similar experience as you as that when I was able to go to Paris Island and speak to a group of Navy chaplains and their primary spiritual job is with young Marines. And so, you know, I was there on the base where, you know, there's only two, there's one in San Diego and the one there in in, uh, South Carolina where they're training these young guys. And what I didn't realize until I went onto that base and saw those young recruits is a lot of the folks that go in come from terrible situations, terrible home lives, a lot of them are homeless themselves as teenagers and, you know, young men, young twenties. And so they come into the military as a way to try to just have salvation from terrible lives. And of course, then that puts so much pressure on a make or break situation. So anybody that's feeding spiritual nourishment into the lives of our, you know, fighting men and women, uh, I'm on board with. And yeah. so it, it was life changing for me just to be in that setting too, Jay, it's just to, to watch it and see how much God is needed amongst, you know, those young men and young women. 
Yeah, it was it was a fantastic event. The funniest thing that happened was uh, you know, one of my good buddies who's been on the podcast a couple of times, Adam LaRoche, he flew down from Kansas, uh, bought a ticket to be a part of it. And uh, you know, he's got grandkids now or a grandkid and so yeah. his wife was uh coming from alabama because she was seeing their new grandbaby so we met them and i hadn't seen them in so long it was it was awesome so we had a plan after the event we were going to get together and uh you know kind of a double date i, I wasn't sure what we were going to do but the event was long so or it wasn't as long as uh as it took me just to get out of there you know, because it was sold, <laughs> yeah. it was sold out yeah. a lot of people, and uh, it wasn't like a normal event. I just basically was there. So y- usually after I speak, I'm gone. But you know, I was yeah. just in the crowd. Well, I looked around and I was like, "Oh my goodness!" So it took a while to get out. So we, so we had this plan, and uh, so it's like ten oh five. I send it because the event. Well, I got out of there about ten o'clock. So there was it was real confusing on where we were staying. And we were staying at this real kind of swanky place on the on a golf course and there were multiple resort buildings. But it's like I was staying uh, in room 3 something, but it was on the 4th floor. And so <laughs> and the reason I'm bringing this up is cuz it was chaos cuz one time Missy and I were kind of walking around trying to find our room. Because most of the time, if you're at a hotel and your your number starts with three, you go to the third floor. <laughs> <laughs> so there was, there was an African American gentleman walking down the hall, and we were kind of looking bewildered. And he was like, "I have a key that says five, whatever it was, five twenty four. And he said, "There's no level five, you know." But he was just <laughs> ranting, and I was like, "Well, tell me about it. We're on three, <laughs> <laughs> and we're staying on level four, but there's no five. And he's like, "What is going on here?" And he was just hollering <laughs> down the hall. And so I was like, "Babe, you feel better?" And she's like, "Yeah, I'm starting to," because we were confused as well. So Adam LaRose sent me a text and says, "We're on level five. But there is no level five. And I said, well, we're on (laughs) level three. I mean, we're on level four, but we're actually having, here's our number, you know. (laughs) And so I thought I had explained it well enough to where, because he was going to come to our room because they put me in a suite, which was very, very nice. And so it's 10.05. We're texting. Okay, we'll meet up. Well, it got to be 11 o'clock. And I'm like... Where's Adam? You know, Missy, she's starting to yawn over there. So I send him a text back. Look, do you need directions? You know, maybe we'll come to y'all. Well, when it got midnight, I was like, (laughs) there's no text. There's nothing. I thought, well, I would have liked to have seen him, but I guess this, I mean, I got to go. We were get. we had to get up at six o'clock and come back home, you know, in the morning. So we went to bed. And so I just thought. Well, it would have been nice to see them. And, and why wouldn't he text me back? I mean, I just can't figure it out. So we're on the way home, and about 9 o'clock in the morning, I get a text. And it, it's from Adam, and he says, I was in a tough spot. That was the first text. <laughs> I was in a tough spot. <laughs> and you know how these people, they text yeah. one sentence at a time. Yeah. So the next text was, so... My good buddy's in town. I fly from Kansas to see him. And I realized in that text that I was the good buddy. He said, but on the other hand, I was in a hotel room alone with my wife, who I had also not seen for a very long time. (laughs) (laughs) I think I know where this is going. (laughs) So that text was sent. And I'm like... What is what is what is he yo, I see the contrast here. And the the last text was sorry, buddy, she won out. (laughs) (laughs) So then I laughed for five minutes and said That's funny. Good call, bud. So I think between the bewilderment of not finding the room and not seeing his wife in a long time, he said, You know what? I'll see you in heaven. There you go. I think you made the right call. Let's take another break. 
So we're kind of living in a, I'd say, a difficult economy right now. Uh, interest rates still up, um, inflation uh, still high. And so one thing we can almost always be sure of is there are going to be some medical needs that are going to come up. And the last thing that we want to worry about is how we're going to get it paid for. And so we've got a sponsor called Samaritan Ministries that has a biblical solution. They're a community of Christians that help pay each other's medical bills. It's not insurance. It's assurance that you're part of a health care sharing community where members can care for each other spiritually and financially when a medical need arises. Uh, you can join any time. Your medical bills are sent to Samaritan Ministries. They notify fellow members to pray for you first and then send money directly to you for your shareable bills. So your medical bills get paid and you'll find comfort in prayers and encouragement from fellow members. And when another member has a need, you'll do the same for them. This isn't a faceless company. It's an opportunity for ministry. And also another thing I love about them is that when an emergency comes up, uh, you don't have to give a second thought to which hospital you use or the ER doctor, whether they're in network. Samaritan Ministries has no network restrictions, so you have total freedom to choose whatever doctor, hospital, or treatments are best for you and your family. So it's a biblical solution to healthcare care uh, where we help bear one another's burdens, which is great. It's also affordable because they're focused on ministry and not profit. Join 80,000 Christian households across the nation that are now sharing 30 million in medical needs every month. Become part of this community today, as Lisa and I have, at SamaritanMinistries.org slash unashamed. That's SamaritanMinistries.org slash unashamed. Join today. But I did want to bring Adam up because, uh, you know, he supports our military and he's gone on some of these missions that were off the grid, uh, trying to protect the innocent and getting oppressed people out from around the world. And, you know, what a guy, he's a baseball player who looks up, yeah. you know, and he's, he's in a fight, uh, just to try to protect people that are, but being you know what I love about Adam is when you talk to him now and, you know, he played, I don't know how long his career was the major league, but it was long. He's a successful player. I mean, really good. Yeah, I think it was over 10 years. I think so. And so, but he doesn't talk about any of that. I mean, that's not what's important. What's important to him is, is what he's doing. He loves to hunt and obviously and fish, but he loves to help people. And so all he can talk to me about is places they've been, what they've been doing. And yeah, I just, I just love it. Cause it's like, here's a guy who was obviously gifted with an ability to play major league baseball, which so many people who love baseball would have loved to got the opportunity that, that don't. And yet all he can, instead of talking about that glory, he only talks about what he's doing to help people, which shows you yeah, a lot about exactly. his heart. Well, the backstory of why he was also there was one of his former teammates from the nationals, uh, who won a world series, Anthony Rendon, he was there and uh, oh, he really? got up and spoke. Yeah. And, uh, signed a Jersey and they auctioned it and all, but, and he didn't look, he didn't talk for, but for two minutes. And he basically said, I appreciate our military and, uh, and I love Jesus and that's why I'm here. And so when I got up, did my speech, I said, well, Adam, I got a new favorite baseball player, player, <laughs> sorry, right. uh, you're retired. So I guess it's, you know, we're back on the free market, but I really appreciate uh, him using his platform, and I was speaking of Anthony Rendon, uh, to do that. It meant, it meant a lot to me, and uh, and I and it meant a lot. I thought uh, from Adam's perspective, not only did he want to support this, but he appreciated his old yeah. buddy coming out there in support of this. So it was it was. It was uh, well, really I'm so good. glad you told me that story because years ago, Anthony Rendon broke my heart when he hit a big home run for the nationals that beat the Dodgers one year, knocked him out of the playoffs. And so I've never liked him and now I love him. Well, so yeah, it just showed you, you needed to repent. I need to repent today. <laughs> I'm repenting Anthony Rendo. And you are now one of my, it's like Tim Tebow. All those years I didn't like him. Now I had to repent. Yeah, I Cause saying, he's I, I was the same way. He's such a good guy. All right. So, uh, we're in Luke 16 is, uh, we read the story on the last podcast about the rich man and Lazarus. And, uh, and we talked about it. Basically, all of us agree that it's a story, whether it's real people or not. I, I think sounds like, Jay, you kind of agree with me that it may, it may still be a parable, 
but there's a reason why he used the names. Cause some people have said that's one of the reasons why it had to be a real story, but you had a compelling uh, argument about using the name of Lazarus, meaning the names written in the book of life, which I had never thought about before. I thought it was really good as well as Abraham being mentioned, who's another name we know that's written in the book of life from the book of Hebrews. Yeah. And who was the, also no- a rich guy from a, you know, from yeah. a material possession, which is debunks this, I think, crazy idea that somehow or another, this is a story just about your economic status in yeah. life. I mean, there are people who teach that. They're like, you yeah. know, if you're rich, I mean, there's multiple times Jesus says it's very hard for a rich person to make it to heaven. You remember the old camel through the eye of a needle? It'd be easier for yeah. that to happen than a rich man to go to heaven. So it is profound, and Jesus is making that point. Yeah. It, it is hard for you to see a need for God if you're so swept up into what you have and think that by your power, status, and money – that somehow or another that's going to translate to you in the next life being able to buy heaven or or purchase a place of honor at the kingdom banquet, you know, when we're all resurrected because you have a bunch of money. I mean, yeah. he's basically given a picture here of that's stupid. That's not going to work. And I think that's the principle he's trying to zero in on in the context of Luke saying that you're putting your trust in money, which in this case, it was the Pharisees of all people who were putting that status and their love for money ahead of recognizing Jesus as the son of God in the new kingdom. But Jace, you, you described it beautifully by describing the situation you were at this weekend. Uh, There were a lot of people that have a lot of money there, but that was a kingdom feast gathering. I mean, that was a gathering to help people who need you know, the love of Christ. And so those people that were buying all those things that were being auctioned off, they were using the wealth and possessions that God gave them for a greater cause. So oh, it's no all doubt. about the heart. You it's, know? It, it, it was an actual living illustration of the first part of Luke 16. That's the right. Using worldly friends. I mean, look, I'm not sure everyone there was a believer, but the believers were trying to help our veterans, and they were trying to use worldly people and their money to do to accomplish that. So yeah. they, you know, they had a big gala. They they had a lot of things. We they wanted everyone was invited, and people with money were there. I mean, right off the bat, when they started the auction, they uh, they had a an auction where they it was you didn't get anything. They just said. It, it takes uh, thirty five hundred dollars, I think, to sponsor one soldier in their program. Well, the first thing that they gave away, or or people agreed to do, was there were a few people who raised their hand when they said, "Who would like to sponsor ten of our soldiers?" And hands went up. I mean, do the math. That's thirty five thousand dollars. Now I don't know where they came from or what they did, but. If they're dropping thirty-five grand at a time, they're doing something with a lot of money. But that's using your earthly money for things that are going to have eternal consequences in a positive. So, Dad, we've seen uh, your videos get censored a few times in the past. Uh, you had one a few years ago where you were plucking a duck, and they called it animal cruelty, even though the duck was already dead. So, uh, the tech companies can shut you down anytime over the silliest. A lot of feathers flying in every direction just to meet the world's food stuff. (laughs) That's exactly right. You got to plug them somewhere, don't you? (laughs) So, these tech companies can shut you down anytime over the silliest things. The folks over at Blaze have always let us say whatever we want on any of Dad's shows. And now they've launched another way to deliver content that won't get canceled or demonetized. If you go to theblaze.com right now, you'll see they've redesigned Blaze News. They've got news, opinion, analysis, lifestyle, sports, and tech commentary. But what you won't get are those annoying ads you see on other websites. All they're asking is if you find their work valuable, visit theblaze.com and subscribe to Blaze News. It's less than the cost of a cup of coffee a month to cut out the ads and invest directly in their news and commentary. 
If you're already a Blaze TV subscriber, the new ad-free Blaze News will be included with your Blaze TV subscription, along with Unashamed and 800 episodes of In the Woods with Phil. So check out the new site at theblaze.com. Luke 16, the final word was, he said to him, he was talking about Abraham and the ones before him, if they don't listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. He, he's making a point there. That ought to do it for him. You know what I'm saying? Well, and he's also, Dad, projecting that someone is going to rise from the dead. It's going to be him. That's my point. And, and they still didn't listen. I mean, think about it, what the apostles faced after Jesus left. I mean, uh, still this unbelief. Dad, you brought up uh, something really interesting in the overtime segment of the last podcast about Zacchaeus in Luke 19, yep. which I think was a great picture of the of when you get an opportunity in this life to do the right thing and this was a guy who had robbed people who was a tax collector and yet when he encountered Jesus and his heart was open he was like I'll give away half of everything and I'll pay He's back four in. times He's I'm all, all in. in yeah and all yeah. of a sudden the possession and if you if you compare that to Luke 18 the rich young ruler you remember that was a man also of great wealth but when Jesus challenged him to not love his wealth more than him, he walked away sad because he was a man of great wealth. And so yep. you see the picture there clearly of what this parable is talking about. If, you, if you're in this life, you got a clear choice because all of us are going to run up against at some point when kingdom principles clash with worldly possessions or wealth or what we love. And the question is, what are you going to do when you face that? Those two men had two different responses. One had a heart of faith, and one walked away sad. Exactly. I wanted to bring up this point about when he, he brought up this this implication of there's this great chasm where those cannot cross over from here to there. Because we've spent two podcasts talking about really what the aim was, I think, and the context of it. Yeah. But there are implications— it's okay to draw implications in the That's finality right. of heaven and hell. I mean, you know, we came up with a, a statement on our earth that, you know, you only live once, you know, YOLO. And I read Revelation 20 in, in the overtime of the last pod, podcast because, you know, there's also this, well, you only die once. And, but, you know, he seems to imply there's a second death, which is what which right. you don't want to be a part of. <laughs> you know, that's Revelation right. 21 8, because the people in that camp are in the rich man's camp here. And so uh, I wanted to bring this up because when you think about what Jesus is de depicting the picture, this is the very best versus the very worst. You know, he, he, he's in agony and. This beggar who never had anything, and you see these little subtle comparisons, you know, like one where the rich man's like, which is an irrational statement, you know, send Lazarus and, and, and just give a drop of water on my tongue. Well, he had already talked about dogs' tongues licking the sores of the beggar you know, when he was at trying to get crumbs off the table. I mean, what a, what a contrast that is. And now all of a sudden you're, you're realizing this picture of he's in such agony that he just wants a drop of water on his, on his tongue. And, uh, and at the same time, he never noticed that here's this beggar in such bad condition. And you never once contemplated a thought of trying to help this guy. You had zero right. compassion for this person. You had zero concern about your family. And now all of a sudden you're wanting to have a miracle. You're, you're a believer in miracles and saying, well, well, go back and tell my brothers, don't come here. And so that's really where that came from. But, but so you also have this picture of this finality of there's no going, it, it, it's over. And uh, the reason I'm bringing this up it's because a lot of people get to the book of Revelation, and I tried to make that analogy in our overtime last time. And 
and people's interpretation of of that is we're like, oh, it's we're gonna have a reboot and a restart, and because yeah. some of the pictures depicted in Revelation are these wars in heaven, and so a lot of people think when Jesus comes back, well, it's like a reset. Then we we're gonna have a war, and I don't believe that. I mean, I believe mm -hmm. any time you have a doctrine where it's Jesus plus something, you know, Jesus plus we got to win a war so, somewhere in the afterlife. Or, you know, I'm, I'm always uh, going to avoid that. Hesitant, because I, yeah. Yeah, because I think Jesus is the focus. It was God's plan. And what he did is enough, not only for you on earth, but for eternity. And I want to illustrate that with that, when he said, you can't cross over from here to there, watch what the language he uses in John 5. And I wanted just to get y'all's opinion of this. And yeah, remember, I, had, I, had written that, I had written that down in my margin, James, John 5. I was going there next. Well, it funny. uses the same. Uh, you know, when you hear yep. crossover, I, I, I hate to say this, but what's the first thing you think of? You think, oh, that's the greatest move in basketball. They'll That's say, right. oh, he's got a killer dribble. crossover. You, you can't stop it. And it's a crossover dribble. And anytime you see it, it is kind of funny to watch because the person trying to defend it, it looks like his ankles break, you know, and he just goes around them, you know. And it's <laughs> actually right. just a modern day way to carry the basketball. It's an illegal move if you go by the rules <laughs> of basketball. But they're like, oh, he's got a killer crossover. Well, yeah, that, there's a reason that's against the rules in basketball because you can't stop it. But in John 5, when Jesus made this claim that he was the bread of life, that didn't go over well. Yep. And, and he makes this statement where, uh, where is it? Verse 28. Said? Yeah, he says that in 28, but there's one part where he says uh, in 17, where he said, my father is always at his work to this very day. And I'm working, but he says, he says, don't work for food that spoils, but is for eternal life. Oh, yeah. Where is that at? Uh, that may be a little bit. It, it's in John 5 somewhere. And so then he, then he gets to his point and says in verse 24, I tell you the truth, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. He has crossed over from death to life. And what's interesting about that is you can have this crossover on earth, which is incredible. You can cross over, to go back to my illustration I use with the soldiers, you, you can be dead in your sins and in the consequences of living on an earth where you have no access to something that can keep you alive forever. We're, we're perishable. But you can actually cross over and God can make you alive. And then he says, I tell you the tr truth, the time is coming, this verse 25, and it's now come when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. So then he makes this big jump into not only can you be alive on earth, you can go from death to alive and, and be and not experience physical death. Not only that, when you do physically die, you will come back from the dead. So it's yeah. like almost a double whammy. Jace, that was John six twenty seven. was the verse you were looking for. It's just a little bit after that. But, oh, yeah. But, yeah. yeah. And, and, and then they started grumbling, you know, right. after that. Uh, when Jesus said in 43, stop grumbling among yourselves, you know, that the fact that he is the bread of life. And, uh, you know, I just thought that's an amazing verse because he goes on to say in John 5, don't be amazed at this in verse 28, for time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good will rise to live and those who have done evil will rise to be condemned. By myself, I can do nothing. I judge only as I hear, and my judgment is just. And so it, it's the same picture there, even coming from a statement that he's, he's doing the Father's work and he is the bread of life. And what's amazing is after hearing that, the response was grumbling. <laughs> it, it's like, 
what? And, and even here in the context of the Pharisees, they're not wrapping their head around this. But, you know, I think as a human being, we've all got sins and we're all going to die. And if you've got a, a guy on earth and, and now in the form of a Bible who was able to do all this and are making these sorts of claims, and if you don't have a better idea or plan, that's when you need to stop. And say, wait a minute, if this is true, don't don't wait till you're like the rich man and all of a sudden say, whoa, 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 whoa. And I really think there's an underlying point here of, of being open minded and really thinking about where you're placing worth and value and security. Yeah, It's just really hard for people, especially who love money to stop their life and say, wait, what, what is the plan? You know, I always do this illustration in my speeches about what is your definition of success? And if you take God out of it, well, what is it? To It's basically to make, to somehow or another, stay healthy, even though your famous line, which is one of the greatest lines you've ever come up with, you know, if you eat right and work out, you'll die healthy which I use that line all the time because it shocks people because they, in their mind, they've convinced themselves, no, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. No, you're not fine. <laughs> you're, you're not fine. No matter what you eat, no matter what team of doctors you have, you're not fine. You may die healthy or you may die from an accident, but it's, it's coming. And so all these arguments that, that we come up with to fool ourselves when you run it out, it's to stay healthy. It's to make a lot of money and then it's to retire and then leave your kids what you have. Well, if you just really think about that plan, Jesus's plan is way better. No doubt. It's just way better. He's like, no, use all that stuff for eternal reasons. Surrender to me. Even if you have to be persecuted because of me, even if tragedy happens to you on this earth, and trust me, that same spirit that raised me from the dead will raise you from the dead. You, you cross over here and now, and I'll give you my spirit, and then you, you'll have eternity with me and those you love. And then guess what? There will be no crossover then. That, that's what I really love. You know, once I'm there in heaven for, let's say, 10,000 years, I don't want something to happen where all of a sudden there's some kind of reboot here. You know, <laughs> oh, wait, oh, hang on. Wait a minute. We're not done yet. I like the idea which because it seems so terrifying to people, but it's actually a positive thing. Yeah. Once you're in heaven forever, there's no crossing over. No. Oh. Well, yeah. As as terrorizing as that is to those who are not on the right side of this, that's incredibly comforting to me. I'm with you. And I think that's why, again, this is a, a parable story, because even the fact that in the story, um, the rich man can see Lazarus with Abraham, uh, I don't think that's literal because I don't think we'll see that. I mean, uh, you know, and I'm just guessing. I don't know. Yeah. But I think that's where we get into the stuff about he he's he's painting a picture. You you, you mentioned it, Jason. This is a beautiful illustration. He's painting a picture here for us. There yeah. are elements here that are certainly going to be true. And like you said, there's no there's no being able to lose what you gain. But it's all about getting to that point. It reminded me of the parable that we talked about earlier about the rich man without member of the bigger barns. He kept building the bigger barns and man, this is, this is so great. And I'm going to build all this wealth up and I'm going to enjoy it. And then Jesus said, well, little did he know that that li that night, uh, his life would, would be lost. And I was talking to a pastor this past weekend and he told me about a story literally of a guy he knew had a lot of money, had built up to retirement. had kept, you know, extending it to make sure he had plenty Retired on Thursday, died on Friday. Yeah. He said he had tw 24 hours to enjoy all that that he had built up. Huh. And it, he said that literally was that story. And I was like, man, that's amazing. Because, you know, I've never well met anybody. That, that's pretty well the root of the matter. Well, I think there's a picture here. I, I, I couldn't agree more. 
And, uh, you know, look, I've debate, debated with different scholars about this passage because I always go to that. I said, I think it's a picture like Revelation. The problem yeah. we get in religion is, and scholarly that, you know, most of the Bible is not some kind of picture. You, you can read the verses and it is what it is and it says what it what it says. But when you get to moments like this, it is a picture. And I think it has to be a picture just like Revelation because we're incapable as humans of grasping the greatness and glory of an eternity with God. Yeah. If it was something that you a concept you could fit into your brain, it wouldn't be that great. That's, that's... So he gives you a picture, but what we do as Bible studiers is we'll take this picture and and let's just say you have a picture that's got a lot going on. It's a it's a hill and there's flowers and there's a wagon and there's people and there's animals off in the distance. Well, then we focus in on maybe one piece of the wagon wheel and say, <laughs> now tell me exactly what that represents. And you that's miss right. the whole big picture that he's getting to say. There's a reason why that famous analysis of Revelation uh, took hold where the guy who was a very smart man, but he said, Revelation, I can explain it to you in less than a minute. You know, there's, there's two sides. God's side wins. Pick a side. Don't be stupid. <laughs> and people thought that was so profound, but that there is a picture of that. And just yeah. like here, there's two sides to this. There's, there's two roads. One's narrow. We, we've used that illustration, and the door's Jesus. Don't be on the wrong side of this, and which is why we don't talk about hell much, and I think we should talk about it more because Jesus talked about it. And I do think that should get you a, your attention if you haven't put your faith and trust in Jesus. It is a factor, especially early on in your faith. And the main thing is, like you said, talking about the reality of it. Because when we talk about the functionality of it, we don't know. And we won't know till we get there. Like people say, well, what am I going to do for eternity all this time? Like, like they're planning a vacation and they don't want to be bored. And I'm like, I'm not sure what you're going to be doing, but trust me, who you're going to be with, it's going to be way more yeah. awesome than anything you could ever imagine while you're on earth. So well, the don't most, worry about the what. The most important thing I think Jesus did, and before we go to overtime, we can talk about this, is here, not only is it supernatural, but this is the only religion in the world, what Jesus represents, where it's also ordinary. because. Yeah. He did come back from the dead, which is spectacular and it's supernatural. But he also had a fish fry on a riverbank after that. It's the only religion in the world who we get to live again. We get to be us in an in ordinary way, doing something ordinary, eating fish on a riverbank. But it's also something that we relate to and we value and we treasure. It's fun. It, it's That's good. Right. And to me, that's what the most appealing thing about Jesus is. He's the same Jesus that was on the earth that said this same Jesus left the earth and he'll come back. And we're waiting on him to come back. So we'll be us, but it'll be an imperishably eternal us. Yesterday, today, and forever. All right, we're out of time. Uh, we want to follow us over to overtime. I want to mention about that fire again. I had a point for that. We didn't get into, uh, didn't have time to. So we'll do that in the overtime. BlazeTV.com slash Unashamed is where you go to get our overtime content. Thanks for listening to the Unashamed podcast. Help us out by rating us on iTunes. And don't miss an episode by subscribing on YouTube. And be sure to click that little bell to get notified about new episodes. And for even more content that you won't get anywhere else, subscribe to Blaze TV at blazetv.com slash unashamed.